Hey, hello everybody, and uh, thank you for coming today's uh, seminar, uh, the, the, the High Five Lab Summer Seminar Series. Uh, today we have uh, uh, an excellent speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Alex uh, Peer uh, from the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's a uh, PhD candidate there working with uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Ponto uh, in the Virtual Environments Group of the Wisconsin Institute uh, for Discovery. So uh, today he's going to be talking with us about uh, some of the work that he's been doing uh, uh, in his doctoral program. And uh, I believe he mentioned that he's probably going to be on the market soon for any of you folks out there interested in, uh, you know, looking for some virtual environments people, which as you all should. Okay, so without any uh, further ado, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Alex. So I'm bringing you over right now. Okay, you're on. All right, so thank you. Um... Thank you for the opportunity to share my work. As mentioned, I'm Alex Beer. First, I'll give you a bit of a description as to what uh, distance misperception in VR and AR is, uh, some of the past work that studied it. And then I'll explain why my work has led me to believe that individual difference and maybe individual calibration could be important. So virtual reality has advanced to the point where it's a powerful illusion. I've seen more than a few people try to set real things down on a virtual desk or to sit in a virtual chair. Our minds buy into the illusion. And for the most part, VR presents what we ask it to, but not always, not completely. The powerful, correct part of the illusion can mask subtle misperceptions, ones that we're not consciously aware of. For example, there's an effect often called distance compression uh, when you experience this effect, objects are perceived to be in a location other than intended. In the most frequently studied contexts, things seem closer. So it's assumed that the environment is compressed towards the view, hence distance compression. An example, when viewing a virtual environment, uh, something like this black triangle in an HMV or a cave, uh, under the effects of distance compression, you would perceive it to be closer than intended by about 26% on average. I'll also note that in some circumstances, we expect overestimation. So compression is a bit misleading. I'm proposing distance misperception instead, open to suggestions on that. We don't fully understand distance misperceptions. We still don't know the full cause, but we do know several ways to influence them to change perceived distance. This effect has been studied since at least 1995, and many influences have been identified. This slide shows a sort of high-level partial summary. I doubt it's exhaustive, and things like depth cues and task attributes could be expanded. Um, but at the highest level, aspect of display device use, the environment and rendering techniques presented by software, the task you're asked to perform in the environment, and sources of person-level variance, like interpupillary distance and stereo acuity. All of these should be expected to have an effect, but none of them alone seem to completely account for the observed distance misperceptions. I won't go into a depth with all of these, uh, but let's look at a few examples from the literature. A head mounted display, common form factor for VR. Um, looking through the little circular lenses, you end up with a restricted field of view, and you have this, you wear it, you have this big heavy thing strapped to your face. Obviously, this is different from viewing things in the real world. So, hey, maybe these are the cause of distance misperception. People have looked at this. Um, Dream Regar et al. Uh, built a sort of mock head mounted display um, and a restricted field of view. Uh, unrestricted human field of view is like maybe 150 degrees. Current head mounted displays are maybe 100 degrees. This was more like 40, 30 degrees. It's greatly restricted. If anything would cause distance misperception due to restricted field of view, you would expect this to do it, they saw no effect. Unless they coupled it with uh, a neck brace to restrict head, head rotation. Then they see about half of the underestimation you'd see with a comparable head mounted display. The same group, um, oh, the word that I'm covering up is underestimation, um, the same group uh, built two more mock head-mounted displays. Um, 
on the left here, you see the head mounted display that uh, they were using at the time, um, where they see the full normal amount, about 26% of underestimation. Uh, the, in the middle, you see uh, they've just sort of sliced the front off of a similar head mounted display. Um, this recreates the restricted field, the same restricted field of view uh, and the same weight as the head mounted display. And with this one, they see similar to the previous work where they use the neck brace plus restricted field of view, about half of the underestimation they see using the full HMD. On the far right over there, you see that they've built this elaborate head platform um, where they've matched the weight of the head mounted display down to moments of inertia. So when you rotate your head, you're experiencing the same forces as when you rotate your head using the head mounted display. And they see no effect. Um, so they don't see any underestimation. Uh, <clears throat> should also be noted uh, that with all of these experiments, they were wearing this sort of collar meant to occlude the view of the ground that would also sort of partially restrict head movement. Um, collar was shown not to cause underestimation um, in otherwise unrestricted viewing conditions, so no HMD, just real world. Uh, but so was the uh, just restricted field of view with no neck brace and just weight with no restricted field of view. So not calling that a flaw of the study, but just that all of these studies exist within a richer context of every device that we've used, every bit of experimental design, that it, that the, it, it we, that all of these things interact in ways that are complex and sometimes unintuitive, and that without combining just the right set of influences, uh, you may not recreate, uh, you may not see underestimation. So that's a quick glimpse at how hardware can go wrong, uh, how hardware can make perception go wrong. Now I'll talk a bit about how aspects of the scene we show might influence perceived depth. So visual depth cues, um, the tools we use to create the illusion of depth. Cutting and vision gives us this lovely chart listing several depth cues on why we see the amount of depth information we expect it, uh, the cues to provide, and on X, the distance at which they provide it. Uh, then along the top, they've divided space into three broad distance categories, personal action, vista space. I bring this up now mostly to show that there are many cues and that they may behave differently across distances um, and not completely captured by this chart that they may influence each other. For example, it's been shown that motion parallax, um, your motion perspective, um, that thing that happens when you're riding the car or if you just slide your head back and forth and things that are far away have less apparent motion than things that are nearby. Um, this becomes a stronger cue in the absence of stereo vision, gear convergence accommodation and binocular disparities. Uh, so this implies that if you hinder one cue by say recreating it imperfectly in VR or by trying to control it in an experiment, other cues might suddenly become active in unexpected ways. So these get complicated. For the sake of this presentation, I'll stick to two broad categories of cues, binocular and pictorial. Binocular cues are those that are informed by using information from both eyes together. In the real world, and when you want to look at a thing, your eyes rotate to bring it into the center of both of your eyes' vision. This movement is vergence. When your eyes' lenses shape themselves to bring things at that distance into focus. This is accommodation. And a specific combination of accommodation and vergence corresponds to a specific distance away from us. In VR, rather than a single object, our eyes are looking at screens that are much closer than we want objects to be. So we position objects on the screen to recreate the amount of vergence we would normally need for the desired distance. This is the main trick 3D displays use to create depth. But we don't currently have a trick to give the screen multiple accommodative distances. In current HMDs, we use lenses to set, the account with fixed, <laughs> to set a fixed accommodative distance, mostly for comfort. But there is an unavoidable disconnect between vergence and accommodation, which are normally tightly coupled in the real world. This is often called the accommodation-vergence conflict. 
the most compelling evidence I've seen for this being an influence of death misperception uh, is this work uh, by Bruder and his group. Um, they don't use a head mounted display, they use a cave where images are projected onto walls and floor, um, when on two walls and on a floor in this case. Uh, so accommodative distance isn't set by a lens, uh, but by how far away the viewer is from the wall. They show balloons uh, both um, in front, behind, and at the wall. And they see that if the balloon is past the wall, uh, the, the distances are underestimated. If the balloon is in front of the wall, distances are overestimated. And if, this, and if the balloon is at the wall, distances are more or less correctly estimated. So things are sort of compressed towards the wall, towards the accommodated distance. Also a weird hiccup, uh, the underestimations are about what is expected. The overestimations are um, less than the underestimation. So it's, the effect is asymmetric. We overestimate less, we compress less uh, in that direction. But the main takeaway is that this accommodation versions conflict is always there uh, and it differs by device and we shouldn't expect to get rid of it without fancy verifocal displays. On to pictorial cues. Uh, pictorial cues are those that don't depend on stereo vision or motion, the kind you can use in a painting or a picture. Uh, here's a non-exhaustive list, uh, but don't worry about those because nobody in distance compression research addresses individual pictorial cues directly. Um, here's a not explicitly um, distance misperception research, but uh, Sridhar and Davis did present um, individual cues uh, using a stereo display. Um, but I'm not sure if they're, I'd call it isolating cues. I'm not sure that they did. Um, see on the left, uh, they showed uh, these pairs of stimuli and then asked which rectangle or which square was closer. Um, but if we take the difference between A and B, if we remove it from the shared context, uh, as I've done over there on the right, there's no inherent depth information there. Um, similarly, um, the original stimulus on the right there and then taken away from the shared context on the left, uh, just this difference in height alone doesn't carry depth information. Um, so maybe like accommodative distance, we can't remove the other cues. We can just pick one state for each, assemble them into one in a larger context and observe different levels of the cues that we hope to study given that context. Distance misperception researchers have usually bundled cues together into these larger contexts, painting their changes with a less specific brush. Few groups have tried comparing cue rich and cue impoverished scenes. On the left, Thompson's group found three levels of cues to all induce the same amount of underestimation including on the left, uh, a photorealistic panorama. So that's a bit surprising. On the right, uh, Kenyon's group does find an effect between no environment and some environment, uh, but using a perceptual matching task in a cave-like display. Thompson used a triangulated walking task and a head-mounted display. So the difference could be a distance estimation measure they're using. It could be the display they used. It could be the construction of their environments. It's hard to compare. Both of these papers used photorealistic 3D replicas of their experiment spaces. So one level up from just a 3D, uh, just a photorealistic panorama. Kunz's group compared theirs to an unmatched textured vision. <clears throat> they found underestimation in all conditions. Uh, using blind walking, the two environments perform the same, but using verbal estimates, the photorealistic version provides slightly more accurate distance estimates. Phillips group compared uh, photorealistic versus wireframe. The photorealistic environment maybe doesn't show underestimation. It shows some under and some over, so they cancel out. It's, it's weird to say that that's that it's showing correct estimation, but it's not the same as just underestimation. Uh, the wireframe definitely shows more underestimation. So now as a question, should we expect photorealistic environments to cause distance misperception? These studies kind of disagree. Even more maddening, uh, in Toronto, uh, 
they were studying studying something um, unrelated to environment. They just happened to have this matched, uh, this photorealistic matched environment of their experiment space. Um, and they didn't produce the underestimation they were expecting. And this spins off into a whole series of papers about uh, matched, about virtual environments that are photorealistic matches of um, the virtual environment. Uh, and they, uh, in one, they um, scale the environment by 10% uh, larger and smaller. Um, both of those just cause underestimation to come back. Um, at the bottom here, Willemson et al., uh, they're, this is the same environment, the same experiment uh, used in the mock headset paper from before. Um, they use a photorealistic matched 3D environment and see a normal amount of underestimation. They're doing the same thing and just quietly at all does uh, the normal thing, the normal amount of underestimation expected. So that's all kind of a mess. Um, the Entrante, the effect seen in the Entrante papers definitely I buy exists, um, but for some reason it's not seen all the time. Another layer of mess. Um, many of the studies I've mentioned thus far uh, use blind walking to measure perceived distance. If you look at a target, you, clo you close your eyes, you walk to where you think the target was, your eyes still close. If you walk short, you're underestimating. If you walked with your eyes open, you wouldn't underestimate. You'd have that visual feedback and you'd see when you'd reach the target. If you're given this visual feedback enough times, eventually you would stop underestimating, even with your eyes closed. We call this adaptation. Few kinds of feedback have been established in the literature that, to uh, elicit adaptation. The most straightforward is unguided exploration, where users are allowed to simply walk through a space. In a 2008 paper, Richardson and Waller saw as much improvement from 45 meters of unguided walking, just letting people walk around with, uh, in space uh, while viewing the virtual environment as with an equal distance of fully sighted walking to specific targets. So explicitly training people to be able to walk to certain distances is the same as just letting people walk around. Uh, I won't go through all of these, um, but I should introduce schematic feedback, which saw the most use by Richardson and Waller. It gives explicit numeric and visual ratio feedback. So what you see here, it was used in an experiment comparing two different kinds of distance estimates estimates of the distance from a participant to an object called an egocentric distance estimate and estimates of distances between two objects called allocentric or exocentric. Participants were shown posts in a virtual environment, either a single post or two laterally. Uh, they, were asked, they asked participants to walk forward either the distance between themselves and the single post, an egocentric distance, or the distance between the two posts, an allocentric distance. This graph shows the effect of feedback on egocentric judgments. So if they perform an egocentric judgment, they're giving feedback on the air. Um, and they did a pre or post feedback uh, trials. Um, feedback for egocentric distance estimates improved egocentric estimates for black box. Uh, pre tests show underestimation and post tests show almost no error. Um, feedback for the allocentric estimates, so they perform the allocentric, the allocentric <clears throat> estimate, they're told how um, much error they had, um, does not correct egocentric estimates. That makes some sense. On the right, we see the effects of feedback on allocentric estimates. Allocentric estimates, were <clears throat> allocentric estimates weren't that bad in the first place. Uh, Given feedback during allocentric trials, they stay fine. But given feedback for their underestimated egocentric judgments, participants then overestimated allocentric judgment, judgments by about the same amount of the error they were making before. So an adaptation to a misperception in one kind of spatial judgment transferred that error to another. This is interesting and implies our brains are willing to do some weird gymnastics to handle big discrepancies when constructing our sense of space. Um, we look at two objects, say, okay, they're about that far away from me. 
Uh, but I think that they're like double that far away from each other, whatever that triangulation would imply. Um, that's weird. Richardson and Waller established a transfer can happen from ego to allo, and in another experiment from virtual to real, participants adapt to virtual feedback, then overestimate blind tasks when viewing real stimuli. They also note that these real world, effect, real world effects don't seem very durable, noting that no participants walked into the door on the way out of the lab. But we have a lot of experience walking in the real world, an overwhelming amount of experience. I do wonder if there might be some task where virtual experience overwhelms the real. Maybe if you learn to play, fly a plane in VR, you'll overshoot the runway on your first real landing. Certainly when building experiments, you have to be careful not to give participants any unintended feedback. So uh, I hope I've established that distance misperception work is complex. Uh, decades of different displays, ways of measuring perceived distance and interwoven influences sometimes make establishing the current state of the art difficult. It's hard to tell how com comparable anything I do now is to what's come before. So my first experiments, my first steps were to establish a kind of baseline. In 2017, I explored measures of perceived distance in two contemporary HMDs. Um, we need perceived distance measures because perceived distance is a cognitive state. It's not directly observable. A variety of perceived distance measures from established in the literature. Um, Visually directed action tasks are the most commonly used. Uh, these involve viewing a target and doing something like throwing a beanbag at it or walking to it. And that results in an objectively measure, measurable estimate. Rural report involves simply asking participants to say how far away a target is. A perceptual matching task involves matching objects shape or position to a real world stimulus or for affordance judgments deciding if say a doorway is large enough to admit the participant. Some manipulations have been shown to have different degrees of effect on different perceived distance measures. So maybe they're not measuring the same things. Unclear. We looked at four of these measures in two head mounted displays. Comparing real world estimates, the brown bars, to virtual estimates, all measures show clear underestimation of virtual conditions, but very different amounts, sometimes pretty extreme, up to like 40 to 50%. But we also see a lot of underestimation in real conditions. If instead we look at the difference between real and virtual estimates, underestimations are more within the ranges we expect. The measures still don't seem to agree completely on, on participants' perceived distance, but they're much closer to doing so. I think this is important. Never possible to define a participant's misperception as the difference between their performance when viewing real and virtual stimuli. I'm calling this relative to percent error, but open suggestions there. In this work, we also saw differences between individuals, looking at individual participants' misperception just for the blind throwing task. We see some overestimation, unexpected, some underestimation under 20%, that's kind of expected, some greater than 30%, which is kind of a lot, and sometimes very different mean error between devices. This is particularly surprising as these devices are all but identical on paper. I wonder if maybe this is due to a different fit, a different alignment between lenses and eyes every time the headset was put on. So it seems participants were experiencing different degrees of misperception. And these corrections may need to be customized to an individual uh, <clears throat> or a device or to a single VR session. A different thread of research. In 2016, we tried a technique we called perceptual space warping. Um, part of the inspiration for this, uh, Cutting and Vishen, speaking of the distance perception in the real world, said, the sheer number of information sources renders implausible any blindly systematic and thorough experimentation of the perception of layout. Such combinatorics suggest that researchers must set aside global experimentation as being simply unfeasible. So no global experimentation, no testing all possibilities, study only those aspects that seem likely to provide the most information. And I was worried about isolating influences of depth perception, about it being impractical, impractical to try. The things we couldn't adjust in hardware like field of view, accommodation, convergence, we were stuck with. 
the things we could adjust in software, uh, geometric field of view and lens pre-distorts, we already had set to what we thought was correct. So what if we could sidestep that big combinatorial explosion of perceptual influences? Just change the scene to meet the participants apparent perceptual expectations. Uh, basic idea, if we expect the target will be perceived to be say 30% closer than intended, can we warp the virtual space to push the target forward so that the misperceived 30% closer is now in the intended position. To accomplish this warping of the scene, we use a vertex shader to move things along the view axis by some warp multiplier. The results of various warp multipliers are depicted here. Warp of one makes no changes. Uh, smaller than one moves things closer. Larger than one moves things further away. We found that a multiplier that should have corrected for 30% underestimation resulted in a change of only about half that in distances perceived by viewers, which is mysterious. Those results uh, are aggregating all participants. Looking at individual participants, perceived distance over a range of four multipliers. So these lines show linear fits of percent error in perceived distance. The axes show the ideal warp these fits suggest, both colored by participant. We see a wide range of ideal adjustments, different for each person. Uh, some of them are extreme enough, the ones greater than two, uh, that they may introduce noticeable distortions. This suggests that adjustments may need to be customized to a person and that we should keep an eye out for any additional effects uh, after the adjustments are made. So we tried that. We had participants provide distance estimates across a range of distances and then used linear regression to generate warp parameters that should, in theory, correct for distance misperceptions. Uh, here you see one participant's relative perceived distance estimates across a range of target distances. The black line shows the ideal performance. The participants showed underestimation at longer distances. The red line shows a regression over these estimates with an intercept fix at zero. The inverse of the slope of this line corresponds to the warp multiplier that would correct the observed distance misperception. Multiplying the existing measure by this multiplier and regression on the re those results, we see that the corrected line in green runs directly atop the ideal line. In theory, this has completely corrected the, the observed error. We also tried a regression with a free intercept. This yields two parameters for the warp. Uh, we use the inverse of the slope again for the multiplier and subtract the intercept from the camera's position uh, moving it backwards by that offset. In theory, this should also correct for the misperception. We call the parameter uh, derived from the regression slope A, parameter derived from the intercept B. Um, using an intercept fix at zero yields only an A parameter, so we call this warp A. And using the free intercept, warp AB. We would expect them to perform similarly. Uh, participants um, first through targets to it viewed in the real environment and then in an unmodified virtual environment. Um, after the warp parameters were generated, participants through to targets viewed in the virtual environments modified using the two warp methods and their uh, personalized warp parameters. There was, clear, uh, there was a clear difference between the real and unmodified virtual trials, indicating that distances were misperceived as expected. I prefer to define distance misperception error as difference between real and virtual. So for most of our analysis, uh, we observed percent error relative to real environment performance. Continuing with the analysis, warp A improves misperception. It doesn't eliminate it completely by only about half. Warp AB does not improve things. Rather, it seems to cause overestimation greater than the under initial underestimation. Distance also had a significant influence. Warp A was progressively worse as distances increased. Warp AB was much worse at two meters than at figure four. Overall, we see much less distance misperception than expected. Two meters, the no warp condition sees negligible error, as does warp A, which may have biased the regression for distances that did see error. These effects suggest that warps are maybe nonlinear warps, maybe piecewise linear across distances might be needed. Here you see a summary of the warp parameters selected. We'd hoped B might correct for misaligned eye depth, something on the order of a few centimeters. Instead, we see a mean of 34 centimeters, 
uh, warp AB then becomes an example of what happens under a kind of extreme warp. We're also worried about uh, warp inducing other unintended side effects. So we look at um, potential transfer to two other kinds of tasks. Uh, we use a blind directive action task, blind throwing to calibrate our warp parameters. So we have two different non-directed action tasks that we uh, observe under warp conditions. The Planck's task participants are asked to tilt an invisible plane when pla with planks attached, with the goal of making the plane parallel to the ground. Uh, slope ground has been shown to influence depth estimates, so it follows that depth misperception might influence perception of slope. Participants uh, view a plane given a random tilt and are able to pull with a track controller to adjust the tilt of the planks up or down. The goal is to make the plane be parallel to the ground. Error in this task is measured in degrees tilted away from being level with the ground. Uh, no significant influence was found for either warp method, although there's a clear trend um, that, uh, if anything, we see um, that the error becomes more negative, which is the opposite direction we'd expect with distance overestimation. In the other task, the cube task, participants are asked to reshape a rectangular box such that all sides are the same size to make it a cube. Participants are allowed to freely walk around the box and are able to adjust the size of two of the sides. Um, one dimension size is held fixed. Participants' goal is to adjust the other two sides to match. This task is expected to elicit size estimates through a combination of stereo, pictorial, and motion depth cues. Error here is the sum of square differences in meters between each of the two adjustable dimensions and the fixed dimension they were to match. Warp A does not seem to influence this task. Warp AB uh, is significantly different than the Warp A case, but not the no warp case. Looks like Warp AB may influence this task, but certainly not to the magnitude that it influenced blind throwing. So, like many other things, these warp calibrations influence perceived distance, but don't completely fix the problem. I'm still working on where to take this thread of research next. But another direction to take, instead of hoping to observe individual difference as driving perceived distance measures, maybe we measure it directly. Certainly we would expect visual acuity and stereo accuracy uh, to have an influence on distance perception. This is the thing I've been doing recently. It's not quite finished. You may be familiar with eye charts like the Snellen chart, uh, rows of letters. You can imagine a variant that used just one letter like these C's and you have a Langle C chart. This gives a bit more consistency. You don't have to worry that your participants have, uh, have a hard time choosing between C and O. Um, these C's are built such that when viewing an appropriately sized C at an appropriate distance, the gap in the C subtends one arc minute on your retina. The small size when you, where you can consistently identify the direction of the gap gives your minimum angle of resolution a measure of visual acuity. There have been two computer-based versions of this belt that I've seen in the literature. Um, Vox uh, frac test is still available online, works on our monitor. Um, Peter Piastas used the test to evaluate a kind of weird retro-reflective VR headset. These two tests choose slightly different ways to render their Cs. Um, the problem being that as Cs get smaller, they'll start to run up against the resolution limits of the display. Bach decided that uh, 1996 level uh, anti-aliasing was good enough to solve this problem. Pluto Piastas modified the C to be square, only drew it at sizes and orientations that aligned with fixes. For my version, um, I want to create a, a natural VR stimulus using as much of the normal Unity render path as possible. Lens pre distorts, time warps, whatever other quirks of rendering. So I use rounded Cs with anti-aliasing, um, positioned about six meters from the viewer, and always centered in the viewer's field of view. Each trial varies the scale so that the gap subtends the desired arc minutes and varies the direction the C is facing among four. And the participant is asked to uh, indicate the direction of the gap using uh, arrow keys on a keyboard. For analysis, I use a method of constant stimulus to find the point of subjective quality, which is taken as a participant's visual acuity. 
We tested two headsets, high resolution index and the lower resolution original Vive. All participants had corrected normal vision outside of the headset, an acuity of one here, all the way to the right. Uh, both headsets provided reduced visual acuity, with lower, the lower resolution headset providing less. Um, this is as expected and indicates that the test was working. On to stereo acuity or um, stereo accuracy, which is what we do. I'll get into that in a bit. Um, two classic methods of measuring stereo acuity are random dot stereograms on the right in that book and graded circles test on the left, uh, left top. Um, the gist of these is to obscure all depth cues outside of binocular disparity viewable only with special glasses. But the raw disparity in VR is less natural in the sense that you bypass the normal render path, um, or in Unity at least. And um, these also involve using lots of added noise to force isolation, which we don't need. Our Dolman test is another way to measure stereo acuity. These involve uh, two vertical rods placed in a box uh, such that uh, most depth cues other than stereo are obscured and the rods can be placed at different depths. Viewers are asked to judge the relative depth of the two rods. This provides a natural stimulus, but in the real world um, does provide some unavoidable size cues, especially if the rods are identical um, and you, or if you view them across different distances. So computer-based versions, both Bach and Frida Piastas are back. Uh, Bach's version is a bit like a Howard Dolman in that you judge the relative depth of a rod relative to a frame, but a bit like a Riemann dot, dot in that the image is generated directly using binocular disparity. Frida Piastas is entirely Howard Dolman. It uses differently shaped objects to defeat known size cues, which I'm not sure works well, uh, at least because I'm not sure where the position of the diamond is well, uh, Relative to the rod, is it the center of the diamond? Is it the front point? Um, comparing the relative positions of two very different objects, there's open uh, allows uh, different strategies to be developed by participants. Also, it's Fido Piastas who coins the term stereo accuracy uh, because this sort of test measures perceived relative position rather than binocular disparity. In the, interest of, in the interest of having a natural VR stimulus, my test is closest to the Howard Dolman and Peter Piastas. Participant sees four circles, all subtending 0.25 degrees, this image not to scale, uh, held fixed to the center of their view. For each trial, three of the circles are placed six meters away from the participant, and one is closer by some amount. Participant close, chooses the closest circle. Uh, the apparent size of a closer circle is held constant by adjusting position and scale. And the results for this one are less conclusive. Um, we don't get nice clean ice curves with visual, uh, like we did with visual acuity, which I think means we don't choose the right range to sample over, or rather that there is no one right range for all participants. We need to individualize it, possibly through iterative testing. So we need to calibrate even the test of individual difference to the individual. Um, that's. All I have for today uh, to summarize, uh, distance misperception in research is weird. Individual differences uh, are maybe a source of influences we should care about. Warp helps. And does anybody want to measure visual stereo acuity other than me? Because I'm building this tool and I'm just wondering if anybody else it would be useful to bundle it up for it on GitHub something. Anybody else wants to use this thing? All right. Uh, thank you to the High Five Lab, Adam Jones. Thank you guys for setting this stuff up. Um, any questions, commiseration, critique, wild theories? Open to discussion. Well, thank you, Alex. I do appreciate it. That's a really awesome talk. Uh, and uh, you, 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 you said a. a, a there was a tiny thing at the end you said that I really, really like, and that's distance misperception is weird. Uh, and uh, at, le at least one of my students is watching. Hey, Logan. Uh, and uh, he, he's been in a class where every semester on the student feedback, 
someone just writes one phrase and this one phrase is humans are weird apparently i say that a lot and the reason i say that is because i've worked in distance perception for so long uh, and th that's really sometimes the only way you can sum it up is that people are just weird and uh, we don't understand a lot about what's uh what's making the weirdness happen sometimes okay so excellent talk i really liked it uh so I, I kept writing down questions and you kept answering them as we, as we went along. So that means your talk is thorough. <laughs> but one of the things I was, was curious about uh, was uh, when you were talking about uh, accommodation and, uh, and I, th I think you were talking about it in, in context of uh, Gerd Bruder's uh, study in the cave. Was that right? Yes, the, the balloon. Yeah, the study. red balloons. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that one. Um, so this goes to, I, th I think this ties into a larger question for, for the VR community in general about the populations that we, that we sample. And I used to take this for granted uh, and because someone brought it up to me once. And I'm like, yeah, big deal. And the, the problem is, is that accommodation isn't, always with us and yeah as i am approaching further into middle age like a train on a track oh lord those visuals um the more i'm realizing uh, that my accommodation is going away and so there's a large portion of the population for which that that's not a reliable depth cue and uh gurjat singh in his his dissertation work i'm i'm I think he's published this. Yeah, he has published this one already. Uh, did an interesting study looking at people who were in like their 20s doing a, a depth matching task in AR and people in their, their, their 40s and up doing the same depth matching task. And turns out, if I remember correctly, the, the people over 40 who were losing their ability to focus uh, actually did much better because... Uh, they, they no longer rely on accommodation as, as a reliable cue. So that, uh, when, when you're talking about, about uh, accommodation there, that, that reminded me of, of, of his work. Um, I, I would like, can, can you tell me a little more about, and I, I, th I think I just missed it. What was the difference between your A and AB warpings? Yeah, so... Um... So A is a regression with the intercept set to zero. AB is a regression with a free intercept. Ah, uh, okay. And we we integrate the the that extra parameter, the offset, the intercept, um, by uh, moving the camera back uh, by as much as the intercept. Gotcha, gotcha. So okay. we were hoping that that would uh, maybe correspond with a, a misalignment of eye depth that um, maybe we're not modeling the position of the eye correctly and that uh, moving the camera back by a few millimeters would help um, put things in the right place. Uh, what we saw were regressions that said, hey, why not move that back by tens of centimeters, which is much further than I should be. So that didn't work out quite the way we expected. Yeah, I, I gotcha, I gotcha. So that's, that's, that's really cool. The, um, let me see, I'm, I'm pulling from the, the, the far reaches of my memory. I, and so, so, so one of the, one, one of the things that, that, that you and most people doing this know, some of our, our audience might not, is that even our perception of the real world uh, is, isn't accurate. Especially once we start getting into like distances of like like 10, 20, 30, 40 meters on out, we, we end up having uh, misperceptions of depth in, in the real world. Uh, and Foley did a study forever ago, and I can't for the life of me remember the name of it, that, that seemed to imply that, that those, those errors were, were nonlinear when, when those real world uh, compressions of depth started sneaking in. And no, no, it might be possible that uh, it's, it's a similar curve, but but occurring at a, a closer distances uh, for VR. That's that's interesting. Uh, so, 
go ahead. So yeah, so the nonlinear space thing. So um, so yes, maybe. And I'm I looked at fairly close distances with that one. Um, I, it would be a little surprising if that were true. Uh, those were distances. I, I think I don't remember if we went to six or four on that one. I'll pull the slides back and look, but um, less important than that. One other thing that may have been happening in that study: um, two meters may have been brushing up against that, uh, like in the the balloon paper, uh, yeah. brushing up against that that uh, uh, accommodative distance plane, the the, um, the place where we switch from underestimation to overestimation. Yeah, it's not very well documented where the HMDs place this focus, where the lenses are set to place the focus. So uh, two meters might be that point, and so it might have been. It, we weren't just doing two meters. I think we were uh, going like five meters or, or 0.5 meters in either direction. Um, and so we may have been, the things we were clustering at two meters may have been um, sort of straddling that line. Cool. And so yeah, that may you. have been a complication. So two meters might be too close uh, for inclusion in that kind of study. It might be, that might be the point at which things become uh, piecewise and unlinear. Gotcha. Cool, cool. And uh, just just a, a note to folks watching: if you have questions, please you know type them in the uh, the YouTube chat. Uh, otherwise, I'm gonna sit here and uh, chew Alex's ear off the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, hey, can 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 I actually see your slide? Uh, by then, it was the yeah. the Fido, hey, the 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 stereo test. Start with an F. Yes, uh, Fidopiastus. Um, yes, that which, one. So we have, which is, and, and I apologize if uh, Fidopiastus ever hears my pronunciation of their name. Um, I apologize. I'm sure I'm, I'm murdering everything. Um, so where are we after? Uh, the the one illustrating what it was. I think, I think it's the next slide, maybe. So we want the stereo test. Yeah, the stereo uh, test. Yeah, 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 this one. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's interesting. Yeah, you would have like. Which which part of the geometry are you you actually referencing? Kind of yeah. issue. Yeah, and if it's if it's clearly if they're not um, overlapping in distance, sure, fine. But that's not an interesting level of stereo disparity yeah. to to be interrogating. So I don't know. Well, this this actually reminds me a lot of a test that. Uh, we did. I think it. I think we presented it at, at IEEE 3DUI in 20, 2016 and we, we we built this specialized AR display where we we locked a person's head in, into a particular position, and we we knew exactly where every pixel across their field of view should be relative to their eye. And so we, we did some calculations modeling uh, their, their their pupil and where we could predict their their optical center and their, their physical eye would be. And we ran into front back end problems on individual voxels. So like mm. depending on the direction the reference line was moving, people were either uh, converging to the front edge of the voxel or the back edge of the voxel, which was kind of cool because then you could perceptually measure the depth and it, the geometry even worked out. Like the actual geometric size of, of of one voxel in space. Interesting. Yeah. Cool stuff. So I'm not seeing any uh, any more questions from uh, from the audience. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap us up there and uh, let's see. Switch back and so so so. Thank you to everyone uh, viewing and uh, th thank you to, to Alex for coming and talking with us today. Awesome research. I actually really really love this, especially the 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 lit review up front was 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 really awesome and uh, i'm Thank gonna you. do the, the 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 classic youtuber thing now and say like and subscribe actually just subscribe uh at, at the very least and the reason i say that is because apparently if you get 100 subscribers you can actually customize the url for your channel because right now we're like youtube.com slash 1000 random characters uh and you know be kind of nice to have something a little easier to find than that all right so with that i'm, I'm gonna thank our speaker and uh and we're gonna gonna end the stream 
Uh, take care, folks, out there in cyberspace. Uh, stay happy, healthy, and safe. All right. Bye-bye.